Okay. We are live. Welcome everybody. Uh, we have an awesome conversation. This is, this is pretty cool. I love how it kind of got together. Um, I have some awesome guests with me today and the topic that we'll be discussing is about the evolutionary extended synthesis and whether or not um, contemporary modern ev biological evolutionary science needs an extended synthesis. So that, that's basically in a nutshell, put in the most basic form, how the conversation is going to go, how it evolve. And, um, and we got some varying opinions here. Um, we have myself and uh, Dr. Seigart here who are leaning towards yes. And we have Jackson and Dan who are saying no. So um, let's just go ahead and um, you guys, if you guys want to do some, just some quick introductions, just talk about, you know, what you guys do, your channels, and then we can just get right into it. Oh, hi, Jackson. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'm uh, just a, a master student in organismal biology. And uh, my channel, I talk about um, zoology and evolutionary biology, predominantly, sometimes veering, unfortunately, into creationism. <laughs> and so I much prefer conversations like this to does evolution happen? Yes, move on. <laughs> uh, my name's Dan. I'm an evolutionary biologist. Uh, my channel is Creation Myths because unlike Jackson, I primarily focus on creation science. So I take uh, the claims and the work of like the major creationist organizations like CMI or AIG or uh, ICR, the Institute for Creation Research. I take that stuff basically at face value and say, okay, let's treat these as like actual like scientific claims and scientific hypotheses. And let's like really dig into them. Let's like do math and see if these numbers check out. And um, as you can probably guess from the name of the channel, uh, which is creation myths, is that the, they, they don't check out at all. They're really bad. And it's mostly what I'm working on is like the young earth stuff um, coming out of those organizations. But I also do uh, talk about some of like the intelligent design stuff coming out of like Discovery Institute. Uh, but the idea is to take it, you know, at face value as the authors want it to be taken as like scientific ideas and then evaluate them on their own terms and see if they stand up to scrutiny. And the answer uh, is universally no, basically. Uh, hi, my name is Cy Gart. I'm a PhD biochemist. I'm retired. I was a research scientist for quite a while, academic professor, and then I worked at NIH for a while. Uh, I began life as an atheist and, <clears throat> excuse me, converted to Christianity later in life. And uh, I, as a scientist, I, of course, obviously accepted evolution and still do. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm part of a fairly, well, I wouldn't say sizable, but a, a community of Christians who do accept, uh, you know, mainstream science, including evolution. I, and I think the leader is probably Francis Collins, who is the current head of the NIH. And, uh, and there are quite a few organizations that, that are, you know, that I'm a member of where a lot of people who are scientists and Christians uh, get together. And we also sometimes discuss at least I do, not everybody does, but I sometimes discuss things with people like Hugh Ross and uh, uh, some of the other ID people. Um, I've had a couple of debates with cr real young earth creationists like Ken Hoven, but I've stopped doing that and I <laughs> prefer not to do that anymore. <laughs> I've it's got one coming up this month or next with, month. With who? With who? With Ken Hovind. Oh, again? Oh, Jackson. <laughs> That's why? I Look, I didn't why? pick him. I didn't pick him. I, I, someone someone uh, else picked him. All right. Well, anyway, it's he's a nice guy. I mean, you know, it's yeah. just, it's just you know, you have to take it with a lot of great salt. Anyway, um, but a whole uh, lot it's, a, life. it's a spectrum. I mean, I think there are... As you get closer to the evolutionary creationist idea, at least I feel, you know, you get uh, you, you get a different degree of rejection of science, and it becomes less and less. And then there are some areas that are, I think, are still gray areas where uh, I'm not well. And we'll get in. This is what we're going to talk about. I mean, I think that there are some uh, things being brought up by non-theistic 
biologists, including as as Tim was saying, the, this uh, you know the extended evolutionary synthesis, which is is not does not derive from theistic uh, people, but comes from mainstream uh, evolutionary biologists, many of them in Europe, but not all, uh, who um, you know have not been satisfied with what's been called now the standard model. It used to be called neo-Darwinism or stand or you know the, the modern synthesis, and now I hear it being called the standard model. Uh, so, and I don't, and I think it's a lot like I, maybe I'm saying too much as an introduction right now, but I'll just say that <laughs> I, I think this whole debate is not that much of a debate. It, I like to think of it more as what happened, you know, in the turn of the 20th century when when all these crazy ideas in physics. Uh, did not supplant Newton, but basically extended Newton's, uh, you know, the Newtonian physics that had been around for so long. And I think we're starting to see that in biology, but I don't know, you know, and that's something we have to discuss to see if that's correct. Well, that that's um, that's a that's an awesome way to, I guess, just jump right into it. Um, yeah, the whole idea of um, the expansion of theories um, and how older theories get subsumed under uh, the newer theories that come out. Um, we can see examples like that in geocentrism versus heliocentrism, that there was just one, you know, particular entity that needed to be accounted for. And then we went from geocentrism to heliocentrism, everything else, all the other fundamental commitments were subsumed under that. But we had to expand our theories to account for it. I think that's kind of the philosophy that's kind of being employed here when we're thinking about these things, especially when we talk about like what a synthesis is and what it really means. And so, um, and the whole idea of, of older ones getting subsumed. So there are, um, I guess, two camps that are kind of going after the same goal. You have the extended evolutionary synthesis project, and then you also have the third way movement, which is predominantly uh, coming out of the, uh, out of Europe. So these are people like uh, Dennis Noble. Um, you have Gerd Mueller and things, you know, who's also authored the extended synthesis book here. Um, people like that who have put um, these things together to kind of almost sound like a sanctuary of people who have like-minded ideas like, hey, you know, um, this is what we feel is uh, should be the way that things are. Um, let's have a place to have that kind of discussion. So mm -hmm. with... Um, with that, I want to get um, Jackson and Dan's opinion on kind of just introductory opinions of what's going on there, and then we can get into the meat. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, um, my kind of my uh, my position on this, as someone who who is like you know. I'm an evolutionary biologist and I, I finished my graduates, my grad, my PhD is in genetics and microbiology, but my, my thesis work was on viral evolution. And, you know, I'm the fields I, I swim in, it's, it's evolutionary biology. And I completed my work just in 2015. Uh, so uh, since then I've been a full-time teacher, but, but for that, you know, that chunk of time in there, I was, I was, um, you know, doing this on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, when I when I read uh, third way stuff or extended evolutionary synthesis stuff, the the disagreement that I have is that it seems like uh, what a lot of people are saying that evolutionary theory needs to incorporate. All those things sound familiar to me because like I was we were incorporating them, we were working with them, we were using those concepts to inform what we were doing, um, often in very different. Uh, kind of realms from how uh, a lot of the well, the a lot of the stuff I've read uh, about EES thinks about it. So, like, just to give you an example, like evolvability, we're talking about this in terms of viral fitness landscapes. So it's not as multi-dimensional as like a multicellular eukaryote, but conceptually, it's the same idea of how do you have ev the evolutionary processes of mutation and drift and selection leading to dynamics other than everyone's racing for just the most fit phenotype within the population. Um, so I, you know, I, I, that's really where I come down is that I, I feel like a lot of the stuff that the EES people say needs to be incorporated into evolutionary theory. I, I 
my response is kind of, yeah, I agree. And it mostly is, is kind of where I come down. I would say that's the same for me. Um, that, that video of Dennis Noble uh, from, I think it's 2016, where he's at that symposium and he goes, to, he has this whole slideshow and he's like, oh, we have this and this and this and this and this. All of those things, or pretty much all of them, I had either already heard of or they were just like standard genetic stuff, or as in modern standard genetics, like epigenetics yeah. and, you know, endosymbiosis and all this stuff. That's all. You know. Would it would it be all right if I just shared um, a figure that I, I actually adapted from Dennis Noble from his 2015 paper on this topic? I yeah. adapted yeah. one of his figures that I use in class every year when I when I teach evolution. Um, it is this one. And it's so this is what I this is what I show my students, um, you know, every year when I teach uh, intro evolutionary biology. This is there you go. So this is just uh, a, a, a kind of a cleaned up version of a figure from uh, Dennis Noble's 2015 paper on this topic. And he shows kind of these 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 rings where you've got the original Darwinism, which is just variation, natural selection, inheritance no knowledge of genetics or the molecular basis for anything. And then you fast forward like 80 years, you have the modern synthesis where you take genetics and mutation and population genetics. You link that with some macro scale stuff like speciation and paleontology. But like at that point, you know, you're looking at talking about like the mid 1940s there, we didn't even know like DNA was the molecule for, for inheritance for cellular life at that point. Since then, we've formalized all these other things, neutral theory, el evolutionary developmental biology, the idea of plasticity, you know, genome sequencing, um, multi-level selection. So you want to start a fight in an evolutionary conference, you just you know, it's a group selection and then run away. Um, you know, epigenetics, like these are all things that we now deal with is just part of how evolution works that weren't part of neo-Darwinism or the modern synthesis. But now these are just parts of the, the ins and outs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I would love to ask, because I wonder, you know, what, what's missing here? And then what does EES kind of, kind of provide that isn't already accounted for? Awesome. Sai, you want to say something? Yeah, well, I, I'll just answer Dan's question. I think. I, I mean, I think. It, again, I, I don't think that EES is arguing so much that you know, hey, you're missing this. They just have what what the EES proponents since I guess what the beginning was in 2016. I guess with that with that uh, conference in in London. Um, what they're doing is they're proposing or they proposed at that time but they continue to do so some novel ideas about evolution that uh they don't feel are getting sufficient attention or are not being um taken as seriously as they would like them to be it depends now there are plenty of i mean i what Dan said is absolutely correct. I mean, I, I'm not theoretically an evolutionary biologist, although I've, I've been, you know, flittering at the edges of evolutionary biology for a while. But uh, the, the real evolutionary biologists that I know, you know, what they love to say is, why are people talking about Darwinism? Darwinism is long gone. I mean, we're way past that. You know what? That's not even a subject of discussion anymore. So, yeah, and so I, I don't think this is really a, a conflict. I think it's more a question of some, and, and I, I think, that, by the way, this entire discussion, if I'm not mistaken, Jackson, correct me, started with a tweet or an answer to a tweet that I posted and you asked me for examples, <laughs> and I said, we can't, I can't do it on Twitter. Let's talk yes. about it, right? Yeah, you're okay. correct. Yep. So, so uh, and what's... What and voila, we are here. Yeah. So, what prompted my initial uh, that initial tweet was reading a, a, another paper by Noble, who's very prolific. I, I hope I can be a, a tenth as prolific as he is when I'm much younger than him. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he just put. I saw a paper of his. I think it was 2018, and I can I can just bring it up. I guess where he actually talks about teleology as a right. component yeah. of evolution 
and it's a brilliant paper because you know the first the first reaction that almost everybody has is what that's a forbidden word you don't you don't talk about you know directed goals in in by in evolutionary biology but he makes a very strong case and it's one that i really resonated with um for various reasons uh, not all scientific obviously but he makes a scientific case he's not a theist as you all know uh and uh let me see if i can pull that one up just to uh, I think if I remember right, the title is something like, is evolution really blind? It's and called, um, was the it? watch, is the watchmaker the blind? Watchma or is the is watchmaker she blind? Eyed? Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. So you've seen it. You've read it. You've seen it. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. Okay. So what was your, uh, what was your impression of that paper? So my impression of that paper was that, um, was that when you, take into account because we know that noble's main expertise area of practice is physiology mm -hmm. um that when you take into account um when you step out of the kind of selfish elements selfish gene type concepts of thinking about the mechanisms and processes that go into these types of uh, that that bring about the um the innovations, novelties, and evolutionary change, and especially when you incorporate that with a systems biology um, look, taking into account physiology and things of that sort, what you actually see is um, it's not a random walk anymore through adaptive space, mm -hmm. um, but rather it is it is that evolution is it's yes it's nearsighted, but in the midst of it being nearsighted there are these um there are these very almost um calculated responses happening that are bringing about yeah. particular changes right. and so when you look at it like that um then like i think it gets into um like uh, the physiological view of mutations and things of that sort right um on 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 that perspective he, he basically comes out and says that no, it isn't this whole walk through a uh, random walk through a blind random walk through through adaptive space, but rather um, there are almost goal directed kind of processes right. and mechanisms right. involved that bring about um, some of the um, changes that we would see as novel or whatnot and, and things of that sort. So that's kind of like a, a very simple kind of overview of what he was kind of talking about. Um, and he really goes after, um, I think, I don't know if it was that specific paper, but no, okay. It was a different paper, but he, he had the same, um, kind of attitude in that paper. He wrote another paper, um, basically saying that the selfish gene concept has no place in physiology. It's a kind of a useless hypothesis. In yeah. Physiology. He, he does not like that idea. Uh, right. I mean, he, noble, noble. It's kind of anti-gene, which is not something I, I really go along with, but uh, he he's very, but he, you know, he makes some good points in that, uh, I mean, one of the problems is he's sort of arguing against Richard Dawkins all the time, and I don't think right. that's really appropriate. Uh, Dawkins is far from being current in absolutely i mean yeah he, he goes life. after epigenetics in greatest show on earth he like dismisses it as neo lamarckism yeah I, no. I actually i actually heard him debating with noble uh on a video and he he didn't he just doesn't get epigenetics so so that's sort of a a, a straw man you know to, to use dawkins yeah. as the foil yeah uh but, but, he, but he also um sorry to interrupt you real quick no 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 go ahead um, I mean, we, we know how vocal Jerry Coin is against, yeah. I mean, I mean, Jerry Coin is a very committed mutation based selection guy. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, um, how we explain, th how we explain well, yeah, it, because um, his research is in speciation. Well, right. Well, but, um, he, he's, um, noble is also at the same time been also been addressing people like coin as well. And coins made certain claims, um, such as something along the lines of um, 
that basically Noble really doesn't understand what he's saying. Um, he's not an evolutionary biologist. He shouldn't be stepping in and, well, and giving his opinions on these types of things and whatnot. To, to kind uh, of go back to Dan's question, is there anything happening like in Jerry Coyne's work that Noble thinks to add or is he proposing anything new? See, what I think is happening is, is there is this no so what noble i puts an emphasis on versus what coin puts an emphasis on is really where the major disagreement is coming about like all the processes and mechanisms are still doing like the things that we've been discovering the things that they're doing but coin wants to go yes but natural selection uh, natural selection is a creative mechanism and 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 he's going noble's going well no it's not it, it can't be and like coin will take into account all these other things but at the end of the day for him it's really a natural selection that's really what we should be kind of focusing our on that, that that's what i take from it i'm just i'm just looking through this um was the watchmaker blind i've never read this paper before um so i'm just skimming it as we're chatting here and i'm looking at figure one and i just um would it be okay if I shared this? Because, like, share yeah, I was, I was just going to um, share it, but why don't you do yeah. it? Yes. Yeah, here because this is actually, I think, a really interesting example of where the, this figure is like a like a microcosm of where this disagreement is, and I come down very much on the gene centric side of this. Um, let me find the right. It's this window, um, and I'll I'll show you exactly what I mean here. So this figure, um, what Even this is showing. Is, yeah, exactly. So this is so immunoglobulins, otherwise known as antibodies, are um, variable, right? Because you have to be specific to each individual pathogen. Now, what um, what Noble is showing here is this this little curve uh, shows the distance from the transcription start site, which is right here, and this is the mutation frequency. And you can see there's more mutations the closer you are to the transcription start site. Now that corresponds to the variable region of that molecule. That's the region that's different, and it allows that allows you to, to be able to your immune system to match so many different pathogens and for you for you to have an immunological memory and be able to, to rapidly be able to target so many different things. Now, what Noble, my, my impression is what he argues is look, this is indicative of some kind of purposeful direction here that we're taking this region that has an inherently higher mutation rate and saying this is the part that's going to be the target because that now makes it makes us better able to respond to these pathogens. Is that a fair characterization, Tim and Sai? Does that sound okay to you? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's correct, except that what he includes there is that what's really important is that the hypermutability is, is uh, focused in this one region and does not extend throughout either the whole gene or the whole genome. And here's and, and, and that's his key point. Right. And here's so here's where where I come around and I say, well, this you could select for this specifically. And the reason is this one, the yeah. genes are extremely highly expressed. Right. And at regions that are highly expressed, the, the DNA spends more time single stranded than usual. And right. single stranded DNA is inherently less stable as a higher mutation mm -hmm. rate. Right. So we could just as easily yeah. say this hypermutation it's not that we're saying aha this is the region that should be the variable region because it's useful for our immunoglobulins we can say the fact that we're expressing the immunoglobulin so much actually happens to either you could take a a neutral approach and say it happens to be inherently beneficial because uh the variability is useful there or we could say we've selected to keep these expression levels high because that increases the variability in those regions and that makes us better able to to uh respond to infection so we have both a a neutralist approach and a selectionist approach with a with a just a biochemical molecular explanation for why this is outside yeah. of and, and noble says exactly the same thing he says yeah there's a place where he actually says this does not imply anything other than a selection mechanism. In other words, he's not ruling out selection at all. He's not saying that selection is irrelevant. Uh, right. he, he doesn't go where James Shapiro sometimes goes about, you know, 
selection can't do this or that. No, what what he's saying is that it's a combination of selection, which allows for this. I guess the, I can't think about the selection of this region, which mm -hmm. works because, as what you just said, everything you just said, yeah, he agrees with for higher levels right. of it, expression, it, lower right. levels of stability. Yeah. It, he's not saying that an animal decides or God decides or somebody decides, oh, let's yes. do this. He's saying this. Yeah, he's saying he, he's using the, the standard biological reasoning why things happen, which is that natural selection works. So I've but heard I, him. Go ahead. Actually, go ahead. Um, yeah, I've heard him in an interview talk about this. So mm. um, and this is this is closer to my view. It's kind of cool. It's like even though we kind of have like this disagreement about the synthesis, we're going to have actually very much different views on um, really what's happening here. So actually, he does want to attribute it to um, something, um, but he, he what he wants to attribute it to is he wants to attribute it to the cell. What he says is that cell recognizes what's happening. It's taking in that stimuli and it has its and through its communication, it's a, it and. In um in respect to hypermutation, it says, okay, now mutate. And but it says, hey, don't mutate throughout the whole entire genome, or right. that'd be disastrous. Right. He says, so mutate here. He says it's this, it's driven, it's a cellular driven response right. mechanism to what is oh. happening. So for, for Noble, he wants to put the emphasis on the cell and cellular communication, biocommunication. Right. Um, and basically he wants to understand, you know, how how cognitive is the cell like not in terms of consciousness but like like basal cognition right. like the like the control of like motor functions and being able to take in stimuli and react to it because we know that cells obviously can distinguish between a food source and something that's harmful to it um so he's saying in the same sense that's what it's doing here um so so he's attributing it to something an agent but the agent's the cell well, I, I think that's right. And, and, and Noble's idea, and this also applies to other people like Kevin Leyland and a number of other folks in this movement, what I think their basic idea is, we're not disagreeing at all about the role of genes and the role of selection. What we're saying is, that's not all it is, and the cell is really important. And Noble in particular, as a physiologist, loves the idea that there's a lot more to cells than their DNA. Uh, that's why he hates the selfish gene, which is, you know, not that mm -hmm. view at all. So now I have to admit that I, you know, I had a lot of conversions in my life. One of them was that I was a gene centric all the way. I worked on DNA throughout my research career and I didn't care about anything other than genes. And so all of this stuff was new to me. And when I first started reading about it, I had to learn it because, you know, I just thought, you know, everything else other than the genome is sort of just extra. Uh, well, you know, D Noble makes some very good cases that that's not at all true, that in fact, it's a two-way communication between various cellular uh, phenotypic properties and the genome. And somebody like Kevin Leyland, who, who works on niche construction, which is another big part of this EES, he talks about two-way communication between the environment and the genome. So it's not just selection acting on, you know, the phenotype and then the genotype. It's it's a two-way street. And, of course, what he loves to talk about mostly is the case where we really see that, which is in human beings, where, you know, we really do affect the yeah. environment and then it comes back and, you know, beavers and other things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that's a key part of this, which is – a new and not not new, excuse me, but a valuable addition to standard evolutionary, the standard model of evolutionary theory, which is that uh, we have to get a little more complex. And and the other thing that both of these guys talk about, which is something I worked on recently, uh, after I retired, I started doing whatever I wanted to do. So one of the things I started working on was gene regulatory networks, and talk about an incredible <laughs> system. Oh my God. Right. I mean, I basically published one paper and I said, I'm getting out. This is too hard. <laughs> it's just too hard, really. Uh, and and frankly, uh, it, you know, we're just starting to understand how these networks work. And 
uh, it, it, it's astonishing the the level of complexity, feedback, and and all kinds of things that go on with these re with these networks. And uh, they both talk about that. And not both. A, a lot of people in in that in the EES field talk about gene regulatory networks and other networks. And what they're stressing is this complexity of interaction as being really important. And I, and I think that's true. And I think that that would be a great, you know, addition. Now, Dan, you may say, well, we already know that. I mean, we're already doing that. And I, I'm not disputing you, but I think it's a, it's a question, it's what Tim said, it's a question of degree. In other words, yeah. how, yeah. how much are we going into that? Can yeah, I, I say something real quick? I just... I'm sorry. I just have to say something real quick, and there then, and then I think, back over. yeah. Okay, so basically, um, yeah, I would say that people like, um, you know, Noble also uh, made another paper, wrote another paper called um, "No Privileged Level of Causation," where he talks about how there isn't this privileged bottom-up level of causation when right, it comes right. to biological change. Um, it can be very much um, top-down or even middle-out. So. He talks about that too. And, and then people like Noble and people like Shapiro, as mentioned earlier, um, they, they, it seems like they just like to stress like, Hey, you know, um, um, what was it? These, um, the cellular responses are what antecedes selection. Selection comes after the fact. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they're talking about, variability and innovations and novel changes and things of that sort they, they like to stress the fact that um all these things antecede selection when um and that's kind of like where they're going which is for the longest time it was you know always selection that was being attributed to and things of that sort even the gene you know going back to the gene centric views so that's just what i kind of wanted to, to lay out there especially for people who are watching which is that you know these are some of the in their writings and in their in their speech and in their talk the dialectic tends to be about that um and i remember i don't know if you guys know of um of a uh, evolutionary biologist named william b miller okay well he um he i i found him i stumbled on, onto him and then i listened to an interview from him um and he's um and he labeled he labels it um cognition based evolution where he basically he really focuses on the cognitive like cellular cognition and the um and how changes come about through that so before i hand it back over to you dan this is this is how he defines it and and i just think this is really interesting because this is something i've never heard before um so he says that basically to him he says evolution is basically a um, a complex a reciprocating interactum that consists of the assessment, communication, deployment, and management of information by self-referential organisms at multiple scales in continuous confrontation with environmental stresses. So for me, being the layman in the room here, I've never seen it ever characterized in that way before. So kind of going back to that, why well, are they saying anything different? Um, to me, that's just, that's a completely new definition and a way of characterizing that I've never heard before. So I just think that was just interesting to kind of throw that out there. Go ahead. Um, I want to get, I want to get Jackson in here, but um, if it's okay, Jackson, I just have a, I just have a quick thing that. I, I'm just um, enjoying taking it all in, you know? <laughs> um, so with these, with, I love the, I love this stuff with, with, regulatory networks and cellular communication feedback loops of all kinds of things and the the reason that i'm a little more skeptical of the importance of stuff like that and i don't want to say i disagree with it inherently because i i listen to both of you and it's like yeah all that stuff is like really important but it's in terms of what's upstream and downstream of what i think that's where there's there's a little bit of disagreement between the different camps here yeah. Because when we talk about things like how a cell responds to its environment and what specific physiological responses you get to that, that's going to be governed by things like what receptors are present in the cell membrane and how many of the second and third level signals do you get. And that stuff is going to be governed by either genotypes 
or regulatory differences. And those regulatory differences, it's feedback loops on feedback loops on feedback loops. I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, the differences in promoter affinity that's going to be due to something like, uh, you know, methylation 1,200 bases upstream and the affinity of that region for a protein. But then you also have to consider the expression levels of the methylating proteins, the frequency of the methylation sites, the expression levels of the enhancer proteins that would bind to that, the transcription factors, you know, that would bind to that site. There's all these different loops. But at the end of the day, what's the thing that is actually getting when natural selection picks, okay, you're a winner, you're a loser, right? What's the thing that it's actually picking? Comes down to differences somehow in genome sequence, not exclusively, but most of the time, that's what's going to be underlying these differences in how cells are going to respond to their environment, how cells are going to regulate other cells based on communication with them. It At the end of the day, what's the other mechanism besides... And I, don't, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying changes to amino acid sequences in protein coding genes. I'm talking very subtle changes to promoters, to enhancers, yeah. silencers, methylation target sites, all these, these broad classes of regulatory mm -hmm. DNA that makes up a far larger per percentage of the genome than actual amino encoding, you know, exon amino acid encoding exons, right? I think where I'm where I I kind of miss the boat is why doesn't that stuff ultimately reduce down to differences in something about the genome rather than something about the plasma membrane or receptors or whatever signaling pathway? Where's the 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 circuit breaker that prevents that from ultimately resting on changes to the genome? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think now that you have that paper, the, the, the watchmaker line <laughs> well, paper, that's that went right to the top of my pile. Re read it, because Noble addresses that, and he mentions several things. Now, some of the things he mentions could actually fit into your category, such as you know epigenetic marks on the genome. So that's also part of the genome. But he also talks about other other, uh, I, and I don't remember it all offhand, unfortunately. But uh, he also talks about other things where the genome is exactly the same as it always was. But because of cell physiological changes, and they could be membrane or they could even be uh, other organelle changes, something is off in the phenotype and you get different selection. Because remember, selection, the target of selection is the phenotype. I mean, I yeah. think we all agree on that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and yes, the genome codes for the phenotype. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's the central dogma that no one will ever give up. I won't give that up either. But... The question is, is it exclusively a function of the genotype or are there other influences as well? And is it possible for some of those other influences to have such an effect, including things like, you know, receptor status on cell membranes, allowing for communication and crosstalk between different cells? Uh, can that at some point rise to the rise to the level of importance where it actually you know, uh, is as important or more important in some cases than the genome. But I just want to say one more thing before Jackson. Uh, there's a fantastic video that I saw, uh, uh, I don't know, a year or two ago by a, a woman. I think her name is Bonnie Brassler. Uh, she, she's a, she specializes in cell-cell communication, and she talked about the intelligence of bacteria. So that goes to what Tim was saying about cog cognition. And, you know, everybody's laughing. How can bacteria be intelligent? They don't have brains, right? Well, then she <laughs> pointed out what bacteria can do. They react to, they react to each other. They react to danger. They, they move. They do all kinds of things. They run away. They run toward. They form communities. And they decide, okay, there's enough of this together here now that we'll all put out a small amount of toxin and kill the enemy or whatever. Uh, and they attack other species. It's, and how is this done? This is, and she explains, this is not magic. This is done by, you know, what, what Dan just said. It's done by, you know, very clear standard, what you'd expect, receptors and signaling molecules. But the result of that is astonishing. And, and that, uh, it was a TED Talk, actually. And that TED Talk is incredible to watch because... Is that, 
Is that the one where she talks about the um, the bacteria in the um, uh, the squid that the uh, they light up once they get to a certain yes when they get yeah. to a certain density yes. exactly yeah, yeah I've and seen then, that one and then yeah. it makes sense to light up because they actually at, at, when you have a thousand a million of them doing it you actually mm -hmm. get light if you have one yes. you don't see anything yeah. so yes that's that's a great so you've seen it so I mean, yeah that, yeah I've seen that one. Yeah. That that's that's really a, a fascinating. Now this doesn't have, she doesn't talk about evolution, okay? But but that concept of you know looking at cells as the the holobiont isn't that what they call it? Yeah, the holobiont hologenome. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've read a uh, I've read a couple very interesting papers. I love all that stuff, biofilms and holobiont. Right. Biofilms, that stuff is, right, right? If I if I weren't in like interested much in macroscopic organisms i think that would be a very interesting region to, to go down you like you like big stuff i know <laughs> yeah uh beetles are pretty cool yeah so well that's big too actually <laughs> well yeah i mean compared to a bacterium yeah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can i just say one quick thing on that same on that along those same lines i saw a fantastic talk when i was in grad school it was called sorry everything with me is about viruses i love viruses but it was called how viruses count to a thousand and it had to do with how a specific type of virus that infects this weird uh, deep sea thing called a cocolithophore. And Ooh, um, I love cocolith. In order, they're so cool. In order for this virus to, to work, it needs to get to a fairly high density because the hope because the it doesn't matter why it you need to have a big burst size. And you, if you only kill your host with right. hundred viruses, you're no good. You need a lot. And the way the way it worked is the virus would hijack just a tiny little bit of some lipid that the cell would use in very small amounts, but if it accumulated too much, it would trigger uh, cell death. And so during viral assembly, each individual capsid takes just a teensy little bit, bit of this and hangs on to it. Normally the cell would break it down so it doesn't accumulate, but the viruses would each take a little bit. And when the viruses got to about a thousand newly assembled viruses, that was the threshold for the cell to die. And so it was a, it was a biochemical mechanism for how the viruses were able to count to a thousand. It was very cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, um I, that's cool that you get that that the um the uh the holobiont concept and things of that was brought up because um the guy William B Miller I brought up earlier, that's his main research and um and he actually puts a lot of emphasis on immunology uh immunology, right? Yeah. yeah. He um he puts a lot of emphasis on that and basically says that the biochemical functions we see being employed there are basically the same um they're the same mechanisms they're the same biochemical functions being employed when it just comes to um the evolutionary changes that we've known about for as well, long yeah. as we've known about them so yeah. it's really interesting because it's at the immune system we really see this the the level of cellular biochemical functions really being employed um and so i just think that's really interesting um and i also really think i just wanted to get what you guys think about um the new frontier when it comes to um fields such as genomics and what genomics might or is revealing to us about selection and things and what's happening and changes and whatnot. Uh, I do want to say, um, like, uh, before Dan jumps in, I uh, totally uh, agree with you on, like, uh, um, the immune system, the, the, the role that, like, bacteria and archaeans play in our own health was um, sadly... Um, not ignored it was not not known for so long and now you know researchers are more starting to get a picture of oh hey we, we have to have these guys so that we can also be healthy we rely on them for so many things um one of my favorite experiments is uh was it dodd uh, 1984 i think um where she has the fruit flies and she raises them on different substrates one is sucrose and one is maltose and after raising them for a couple of generations she tries to bring them back together and they can't interbreed and at the time that they were like Right, it was yeah, it was an that doesn't really make any sense. Turns out it's their gut bacteria. Their gut flora was uh, giving off uh, certain metabolites, which are uh, volatiles, which they which made the flies not want to reproduce anymore. And so yeah, there's there's like 
speciation going on. Yeah. But it's because without they're back genome, without before. genomic effects. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And but this was back in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This was. I mean, well, it wasn't known that it was their gut floor way back then, but you know they they've been aware of such things like this for oh, a number yeah. of years. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I agree. There's nothing really new here, but yeah. as I said, I think it's a question of emphasis and. But it goes a little bit beyond that also. And here's, I think, where we get to the real, what I consider the real essence of the issue. And, and that has to do with evolutionary theory. Uh, because, you know, we have very good, I, I, I mean, I don't have to tell Dan, he can, he can instruct me on this, but there's very good body of evolutionary theory, which is basically, as far as I can tell, uh, originally came from population genetics, and then it expanded a bit. It's mathematical, it's precise, it's very accurate, but it doesn't incorporate a lot of this new stuff. It doesn't incorporate, you know, the very, very weird complexities of regulation, regulatory right. network. And that's, and that's where I think the field has to go. It's not just a question. So in other words, it's not just simply arguing about whether this is new or it's not new or it's, it it, it 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 has to be i think and and i haven't read this anywhere else this is my own thoughts because i like theoretical biology uh i i think there has to be a recognition uh by by evolutionary biologists that we need to update the theory that's really what i'm coming to and and that's not easy to do i don't know how to do it but you know somebody has to look at this stuff and say okay how do we now you know get this to be the way evolutionary theory has been, which is, you know, very useful, very predictive. You can, you can model, you can calculate, you can tell what's going on. And, and I think that if we are able to incorporate some of these new ideas, whether it's, you know, this Noble's version of teleology, which is sort of a misnomer, but that's, that's what he calls it, or whether it's, you know, the kind of stuff we've all been talking about, which is, you know, cellular responses. Uh, how do we get that into standard evolutionary theory and, and basically grow the field and move it forward? And I think going back to my original comment, that's what Einstein did. He had, the, he had these ideas because physics is easier, but, you know... <laughs> Physics is easy compared to biology. I mean, I think we all agree with that, right? Yeah. You know, I tell sorry, that, Josh. I tell that <laughs> all my students, and I say, look, everyone's complaining about chemistry. Everyone's complaining about physics. No, bio is the hard one. Physics absolutely, hard. absolutely. It should I, not be I, taught I, first. It should uh, be taught last. I I did not enjoy <laughs> I did not enjoy chemistry, and I especially and I'm sorry, so I did not enjoy organic chemistry. I'm sorry, I said it. I said it. <laughs> Here, uh, I, you know, you're an amazing biologist. We need some of you too. I mean, you know. <laughs> can I, so I think there, I think there's kind of two. Bro oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tim. No, I, I just wanted to say, like, like I, I just, I just love having you guys talk since um, I'm the one that's going to know the least in the room here. Um, I just think that, you know, from and maybe this is just because I was raised, I was fed i was a, i was fed so many creationist lies that that's just something that i remember but i just remember that even in school and things of that sort that even in the light of all the evidence uh, all of the um just the variety of research projects happening within um and subjects and areas of specialization within evolutionary biology right now are, are happening and happening and taking place that like i had no idea that any of it existed and this is actually like like what a 21st century view of evolution looks like i was always under the impression that it was this whole um it was this um mutation based random, selection random, like that was right, it right. um it basically stops at like hardy weinberg equilibrium yeah and well right. that's purposeful they that's do it. that on purpose right. it, it's not an accident that that's the way it is in yeah, creationism. Okay. yeah 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 exactly and and once i once, I mean, it was literally just in the beginning of 2020. I, um, no, it was, it was November when I reached out to Sai and I was like, what are some sources you got for me? And as I started reading, I was like, well, one, I was like, man, I was really lied to for so long. And it actually made me angry Two, 
um i'm like so why why aren't like i guess there of course there's always going to be that chasm between the public and the popular si pop science and then like what's actually happening because mm. you know it takes what and what's in the textbooks is always going to lag by like five to ten that's years right. Yep, exactly like, like, exactly going on yep and so i just saw that and i was like okay why aren't um why isn't this like being talked about, you know, on the public level? Because um, I, I just, I just think that laymen and public just have a really like weird view of evolution. Like they just yeah. really don't know what's happening. Well, like, you know, Ray, Ray you, Comfort uses that as a leverage. Like, oh, well, look, you don't understand. But, I mean, look know. at look at who the main, who's the main person who is doing the popular understanding of science. Who's the one main guy? Bill Nye. It's Richard, it's Richard Dawkins. Oh well, for in biology, biology. Yeah, yeah, for biology, yeah. I, yeah, for science generally, yeah, it's, pro it's probably like Bill Nye, or, or Neil, deGrasse Neil deGrasse Tyson, Tyson. yeah. But yeah. no, it's Richard Dawkins. What is Richard Dawkins? He is the most hardcore neo-Darwinist guy like alive today, probably. Right. I mean, yeah, sure, you can say like, okay, he also accepts like Evo Devo and stuff. He kind of gives it a very short like Evo Devo is cool. Back to natural selection, but <laughs> but. But he's kind of the main guy. And when you read his books, you know, whether it's Ancestor's Tale or Greatest Show on Earth, whatever, um, he's really just about like its variation and natural selection. That's yeah. kind of his main thing. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I have to say that I, I really like Dawkins, surprisingly enough. Oh, I mean, I've read uh, six of his books. He, I, yeah, I, I mean, he, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's are interesting. And I agree with a lot. He's a great writer and he really says some very good stuff i i think the ancestors tale is genius it's my favorite book yeah it, it's it's a genius book uh and you know when he wrote when he first wrote the extended phenotype and the, and the selfish gene the, the, they were quite brilliant i thought um I, I i think this is an example and i should probably pay close attention to this of someone who's a little bit past their due date uh frankly i mean i he just he just isn't keeping up and uh and that's too bad because he's he's a smart guy he could keep up if he wanted to but i don't he's not i mean i saw him have an argument with lynn margulis oh on, yeah that okay yeah. i mean that was another video and on, oh, on endosymbiosis uh, endosymbiogenesis and that was Symbiosis. embarrassing you know yeah. i mean he's arguing with lynn margulis on it i mean come on so uh you know he he needs to <laughs> Maybe do something else, which actually he is doing. Now that I think about it, <laughs> yeah, he he was also the guy who argued, uh, you know, oh, well, his his argument with Gould over punctuated equilibrium was kind of intriguing yeah. because he starts off with like, oh, it doesn't happen, and then by the end of it, he's like, well, yeah, what was everybody arguing about? What's the problem here? You know? Well, does that sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I mean, yeah, no, that that's really good. I just. I just remember my reaction when I found out. I don't know if it was a DNA transposon or it was a retrotransposon, but it was involved. It was involved in the exactly. mammalian, uh, the formation, exactly. the development of the mammalian uh, immune system. Oh no, it wasn't Sincite. Never mind. I thought it was going to be Sincite. Oh yeah, you were, you were thinking of the the placenta. I was yeah. thinking of the placenta one. Right. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, that's and, that, the and that's also that's amazing too. That was. <laughs> yeah. That was. Oh, you know, if, for me. if you haven't read it, uh, Tim, I would highly recommend uh, Neil Shubin's newest book, uh, Some Assembly Required. It is right. fantastic. Yeah. It's my favorite of his three books so far. Oh, I, I think I liked uh, some. Um, I, I liked uh, uh, your inner fish. Your inner, I liked your inner fish better. Oh, I mean, it's but, good. But, it's really good. Some Assembly Required was excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's there's kind of, I feel like there's kind of like two branches here that we're talking about. And it's kind of like two two kind of different. I don't want to say places for disagreement but two kind of avenues um i think one of them is kind of the teleology side of things of like to what degree our cells kind of choose and I, you know air quotes choosing but to use the language right to right. do what and then on the other side of things there's like the what you might call like the interactome side of like to what degree if i'm a cell and there's another cell that signals that detects something and then it signals me and then i'm going to change my phenotype because of that signal and now I'm going to be selected, you know, better or worse, depending on that change to your whatever signaling pathway you are doing, right? That that kind of level of things. 
I want to put that one aside because I actually think that's harder to explain in kind of the classical way. I don't want to say the neo-Darwinian way because we're, you know, past that. But like the on the on the teleology side, the thing that I I always try to give people the the impression is that when you have something like the immune system or the parasites that are trying to evade the immune system because they largely do like trypanosomes basically do the same thing but opposite so they they mess they're constantly shuffling their like cell surface uh uh mm-hmm. not really receptors but they're they're they're, you know, they're id tags um in an effort to evade the immune system and in both cases and you see this all over the place with, yeah, with uh, viruses intragenomic uh, recombination and rotifers and sos repair oh. mechanisms and bacteria like all mm-hmm. these weird things what they do is they generate lots of diversity with right. no regard right. for whether it's actually useful or not but right. then how do you find the things that are useful? Selection finds that, that right? You generate right. a thousand new right. variants and then like two might help. And those are the ones that persist, right? So I think that's actually yeah. not super hard to explain without invoking other other kind of levels of, of stuff going on. But I think the interactome side of things is a lot more complicated where you start invoking feedback loops and kind of reciprocal selection on very distinct entities that maybe are not even directly interacting with each other, but you've got something over here, you know, releases a metabolite into the environment and then three other things detect it and respond a certain way. And then something over here, you know, responds physiologically to the, what that last thing in line made. And now it's phenotype changes and selection operates on that change due to what this thing over here did, even though those two things are not interacting with each other. That's a tricky thing. And that's where, I think there's absolutely room to go more into the conversation of, you know, at what level is selection actually operating there? And what is the thing that gets inherited when selection is operating? Because in that situation, the selfish gene view seems to me to have an issue, right? The the gene centric view, or or I'll say the genome centric view rather than genome to be inclusive. You know, I, 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 I I agree with that, and I and I think the key, one of the key things to point out is that selection itself is a very complex thing, right? We know that. I mean, we you are, sometimes cannot predict what will be selected for, uh, and, and just on what you were saying, I mean, so which thing is being selected for? It could be that they're all being selected for in different ways, and maybe even in contra. Yeah. So, I mean, the complexity of the biological world is, is. It's a little bit. Just a little it, it's bit. just it's beyond, it's, it's beyond yeah. words. I mean, so, and, and we're not supposed to understand it. I mean, that's, that's what, it, you know, it, biology doesn't care that we get it. I mean, why right. who are we, right? Yeah. It just does it. And. You know, and if we can get some small glimpses as how these things work, I mean, you know, I when I, as I told you, I was working on these gene regulatory networks, and I just use was using model networks with five genes, five, which is nothing compared to reality. Which is not very many, not very many genes, five, and <laughs> I couldn't believe that, that you just do some simple, you know, sorting of interactions, and the results are. Unbelievable, astounding, and of course, when you look at real regulatory networks, biology has already figured that out. You don't have five really tight genes. It, it very these networks are very dispersed. There's a lot of room in between, and it's you know it, we get little glimpses of this kind of order, but it's it's really hard to build models, and that's why I think it's so important to try. Because this is reality. This is biological reality. And and if you know, even niche construction, which is, you know, a fairly simple idea, and it does have to do with selection in two different areas and two fronts, you know, because you have two things interacting more or less equally is the idea. So you have selection on both ends. So then the question is, okay. How do we model that and start to use it for predictability, you know, as a biological science? And that's where I, I think yeah. that's where I would hope that the next step in the EES comes from. It's it's they've articulated the ideas, great, good ideas. 
Some of them are going to turn out to be nonsense. Some of them are going to turn out to be good. And the ones that are good have to be developed and, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and brought into mainstream uh, theory. Yeah, it's like, you know, which model will allow us to get onto the right set of tracks, right set of rails? Yeah, and we don't down. know. I, I mean, it's selection for us too, right? I mean, we're going we're gonna to come yeah, up with ideas, and, we, and the right ones are going to get selected for. I mean, that's memes. what's going to happen. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Talk, it's memes, right? It's, it's, yeah, universal, right? it's universal Darwinism. Yeah, that's it. There you go. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's another discussion. <laughs> oh, no, we right. don't need to have that discussion. But. <laughs> um. Well, we're literally like almost like right bump up against an hour here. Um, this has been really, really awesome. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out and um, and just discussing the various viewpoints. And um, usually how it happens for me is I go in thinking that there is more disagreement than there actually is taking place. And I'm glad that I got people who are actually involved and in working into this to actually kind of reveal that. So that's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, uh, if you guys just want to, um, you know, tell viewers where to find you, where they can they can go, because my audience is very specific. Um, you know, um, go ahead and do that, and yeah, get us started, Jackson. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you can always uh, find me at my channel, which is just Jackson Wheat, easy peasy. Uh, or I'm also on uh, Twitter at uh, Jackson Wheat One, so also easy to find. Plug the book. Oh, right. I all RJ Downer and I also have a book. Thank you, Dan. I would have forgotten that. Um, we wrote a book, uh, The Rocks Were There, uh, which is a it's an entire book about countering creationism. Uh, and so if if you like that, if you like um countering creationism with biology, geology, and paleontology, there you go. And we will have a second one, so look forward to that also. Thank you, thank you, Dan. <laughs> we uh, like royalties, thank you. <laughs> uh i'm dan uh my channel is creation myths it's linked in the description thank you for that tim um if you like kind of piggybacking off of what jackson just said if you like um looking into young earth creationism in sometimes excruciating detail um check me out uh i'm very genetics focused um but i do branch off into other things occasionally but genetics is Kind of my field so um but yeah my channel down below check that out if that is something you're interested in well since we're plugging books this is mine works <laughs> of his hands a scientist's journey from atheism to faith uh i i guess that some of this audience is christian right tim so some of you yeah some mm -hmm. of them may be interested in some of this it has a lot of science. There are two chapters on evolution. Uh, one explains what it actually is and what it isn't, which is very important because uh, there's a lot of confusion about that. I appreciated that, yeah. And uh, and another chapter. Actually, a lot of the chapters about modern evolutionary biology, including a little bit about the EES. So uh, that's, that was, that's part of the book. And there's also a lot about how I actually came to faith very, very slowly after an atheist upbringing. And uh, I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, my my website, which has anything you want to know about me more than you would ever want to know, is cygart.com. Very easy. Advantage of having an unusual name. Uh, and uh, uh, you can find a lot there. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Um, well, I think um, we got through what we wanted to do. And... Um, I think given, especially given my audience, um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of rewatch value with this, uh, this discussion. So I thank you guys.